Hey friends, welcome to Ivy Swartress. I'm a Shantae reading friend. And today we have A Girl Named Dan by Dandy Dolly Macau, illustrated by Renee Graf. Well, or Grafe. I hope I'm saying those names right. If not, I do apologize. Now, before we get started, you know we have to sing our welcome song. So get your friend's fingers ready. And one, two, three, go. Hey there, friends. Hey there, friends. Welcome to Ivy's Fortress. Hey there, friends. Hey there, friends. Welcome to Ivy's Fortress. I'm glad that you are here with us. I'm happy that you're near. Come along for our adventure. It'll bring you lots of cheer. Hey there, friends. Hey there, friends. Welcome to Ivy's Fortress. Oops. Hey there, friends. Hey there, friends. Welcome to Ivy's Fortress. All right. Well, our book today is a long one. And it's a very interesting one because I feel like a lot of young girls think about these things when they are referencing their name or talking about their name. And my name is not very unisex, meaning boys have it and girls have it on a normal basis. But... I do understand, and I've had a lot of peers that had girl and boy names. There's nothing to it because it's your name and you make it what it means for you. Whether it's your friend's name, Tammy, who's a boy, or your boy, who his name is Lindsay. It doesn't matter. It's your name. You make it what it means to you. So without further ado, let's get reading. We have an author's note before we start our pages. Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 was a 37-word law that said, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. It gave girls a chance. Thanks in part to Title IX, my oldest daughter played school volleyball, my youngest daughter played Special Olympics basketball, volleyball, and swimming, and they both played softball, reminding me of a girl I used to know named Dan. But things weren't always that easy for a girl. In 1961, the whole world was competing against itself. Two major teams faced off, Russia and the United States of America. It was men who played in this big game, of course. Our side sent a secret spy who got shot down and captured by their side. Their team captain, Nikita Khrushchev, got so mad at our team that he took off his shoe and pounded the table at the United Nations shouting in Russian, we will bury you. Ouch, I did that on my leg. We all watched this on black and white TV and hoped it was just game chatter. Turns out Earth wasn't a big enough playing field for these two teams, so the men took it to outer space. Russia sent up Sputnik satellites with dogs in them, so our new team captain, John F. Kennedy, promised we'd get a man up in space first. We signed Hawaii to make 50 United States, but our team spirit wasn't the greatest. Martin Luther King kept telling all of us that black and white people were on the same team. Not everybody was listening, but the game went on. Now to add a reader's note, I'm not a fan of this game, and it's not really a game at all. Livelihoods, families, generations of encouraged immigrants and people just like me and you have been ruined, lost, because of egotistical battles and wars because nobody just wants to accept the world for where it is and the people for who they are. Now, let's get reading because you don't want me to get on that soapbox. For me, 
Growing up in Hamilton, Missouri, population 1,701 before the shoe factory closed, there was only one game that mattered. My daydreaming always led me straight to the plate. It's game seven of the World Series. The A's are down by three. Bases loaded, two outs, bottom of the ninth. Up to you, Dandy, come the cries from the KC dugout. I crowd to play with my stand the man batting stance. First pitch is high and inside. A little chin music to show me who's in charge. The next one catches the plate. I'm on it, but tip it back. The pitcher, worried, throws high heat for a two and one count. He jams me inside with the changeup. I have to hit. Foul ball. He throws low for a full court three and two. A foul off a warm, warm burner by third base. Then I see it coming. Fastball, high outside corner. I know before the crack of the bat, the left fielder sprints to the wall to stop cold and watches it go over the fence. A grand slam. The fans go wild. Dandy, dandy, dandy. Dandy, Ray elbowed me. Who wants outside recess, Miss Albertson asked. Boys waited for outside, girls inside, except me. We went outside. Ray picked me fifth even though the guys knew they could count on me to get on base. I may not have been a fence buster, but I could hit them where they ain't every time. And I had a good leather in the field with speed for shoestrings catchy. When the whistle blew, we were two runs up on Roger Stevie's team. I knocked in three runs on a slow bender and caught Roger's can of corns for the last out. I raced home after school to change. It wasn't fair that girls had to wear dresses. By the time I got back, the guys were already in a pickup game. I headed for the outfield where Roger cut me off. You can't play, he said. How come? I glanced over at Ray, who would look up from the mound. Because you're a girl. From now on, it's boys only. How rude. Walking home, I fought off girl tears. Nobody ever caught me napping like Wayne or chasing junk like Roger did, but I couldn't play because I was a girl. Two problems here. One, tears don't have genders. If you cry, they're your tears and you own them. It's not because you're a girl. It's not because you're a boy. It's because you felt like crying and that's why you have tears, okay? And two, She's so qualified to be able to play. Why? Because she's a kid in school with schoolyard friends and it doesn't matter what gender she is. At this time in our history, it did. And people thought that girls couldn't do what boys could. But let me tell you, girls can do everything a boy can and boys cannot do everything a girl can. Now the quality is up to the people who work at what they do. but. Keep that in mind. I hated recess without baseball. Instead of swinging a bat, I was forced to swing with girls and listen to talk about movie stars like Haley Mills or teen idols like Fabian. I still love playing catch with my dad after dinner. Hey Dan, dad said, using my wish you've been a boy nickname. Guess what Charlie O's up to now? Charlie Finley, the A's new owner, would try to get anything to get bigger crowds at games. He's building a mechanical rabbit to pass balls at the umps. He's having an essay contest to get bad boys. Something stirred inside me like when I was fixing to steal a base. Bad boy for the Kansas City A's? Saturday, I took my big chief tablet outside where I could hear morning doves and barking dogs and smell alfalfa and clover. Ray came over. He heard about the contest too. We set to work side by side. I'd write something, then scratch it out. Write, scratch, write. Done, Ray announced. Read it, I said, hoping he couldn't see how bad I wanted his to stink. Ray stood up and read. I really, 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 really want to be a bad boy for the A's because they are so very, 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 very good. 
He grinned. It's not quite 50 words, but I can add more reallys and varies. Relieved, I burst out laughing. Oh yeah? Ray shouted, pulling the entry form from his pocket. Well, you can't even enter the contest. He threw the entry at me before stomping off. I smoothed it out. At the bottom, in tiny letters, it read, for boys only. For days, I worked on my 50 words. Finally, I had it. Why I want to be a bad boy. At the crack of the bat, I loved that second of silence before boys, girls, parents, poor, rich, exploded with one voice. On a strikeout, I want to hear our groan like we feel the same thing. So it's okay. We can't be so different if we feel the same. I signed it Dan Daly and walked to the post office. Time passed. Ray and the guys signed up for the Little League, boys only. Then one morning, two men in three-piece suits showed up at my house. Little girl, said the tallest guy, we'd like to speak to your brother. Don't have a brother, I answered. Well, my sister? The short, bald guy popped open his briefcase. It had a Kansas City A's emblem on it. We're looking for Dan Daly. Dan Daly? My head felt like I'd been beamed. Then I got it. I won. She won. I couldn't stop screaming. I won. I'm a bad boy. But the men weren't cheering. I panicked, afraid I'd been wrong. Didn't I win? I cried. You won, the tall man answered, still not smiling. Only, only what? I demanded. You're not a boy, he said. He snapped his briefcase and muttered. This was not a bat girl contest, little girl. I didn't get to be a bat boy. Rules were rules. But a few days later, I received an A's baseball cap in the mail, then a jacket, which I stuffed in my closet with the hat because I had become a diehard St. Louis Cardinal fan. The next day, a long box arrived from Kansas City. I knew what it was. I didn't want to open it, but I couldn't help myself. I slid it out, inhaled the wood, balanced it on my fingers, felt the carved baseball insignia. I thought of all those bats I never hand to players, just because I was a girl, and I knew what I had to do. I grabbed the bat and headed for the schoolyard. Just as I'd expected, the guys were all there. Roger at the plate, Ray on the mound. I never slowed and I scooched between Roger and home plate. I'm batting, I said. It's a three, two count, Roger protested. I'm batting, I repeated. Ray knew I meant business because he motioned Roger back. I'll pitch to her. Anger surged through me as the first pitch came in high and outside, gathering strength from every injustice I the girl who couldn't play swung that bat. There was a crack as bat met ball. I got a glimpse of boys in the field, heads back, mouths open, as my ball sailed over their heads, over the fence, across the ditch, across the road, and into the burger's yard where no ball had ever gone before. I rounded the bases as if I did this every day, tagged home, then kept going. Dandy, Roger shouted. You forgot your ball, your bat. Without turning, I replied, let the bat boy bring it. That gave me chills because that is so savage. Anyway, go dandy. <laughs> that year, the Yanks took the series in game five. Roger Maris smacked a 2-0 pitch into right field for his 61st homer, beating out Mantle and breaking Babe Ruth's record. America got men into space, and President Kennedy promised we put man on the moon. Russia started building the Berlin Wall to keep our side out and theirs in. The A's finished dead last in the American League. 
I didn't much care. I played the ball with my dad and cheered for the cards. And I kept writing. I wrote about baseball. Then I wrote about dreams. I'm still writing. Oh, how inspirational. Man, Dandy, you have inspired me to, of course, be great at whatever I choose to be and not minimize it to because I'm a girl or because I am a girl or because that maybe I'm a girl. That doesn't matter. If I want to be great at something, then I should go ahead and try to achieve it and work very, very hard, anger, even through my anger and frustration and irritability because nobody sees me for who I am, but I see me. And the only way that I can get others to see me is that I love me and I see who I am and I continue to be that person every day. You see when Dan was angry and she went back to the baseball field and she hit that ball as hard as she could? Well, that's what you have to do in your craft. If something is unjustified or it feels political or it feels like somebody is just making your life harder for no apparent reason, then guess what you can do? You can take your emotions, good, bad, or ugly, and bring them right to the field, right to the craft room, right to the studio, and say, I'm here because I'm supposed to be, and work out your craft the best way you can. Well, that's enough spill for me. Let's read about our author and illustrator. Dandy Daly Macau. Dandy really did win her first writing contest as a Missouri tomboy. Her 50 words on why I want to be a bat boy won first place, but the team would let a girl be a bat boy. It was her first taste of rejection. She rebounded and went to, be, went to become an award-winning author of 400 books for children and grown-ups with sales of 4 million in 22 countries. Recent picture books with Sleeping Bear Press include The Legend of Ohio and Rudy Rides the Rail, a Depression-era story. Dandy is a national speaker and has made dozens of appearances on TV, including ABC, NBC, and CBS. She lives with her husband, children, and horses, and dogs, and cats in rural Ohio, where from time to time she can still round up everybody for a game of softball. Visit Dandy at www.dandybooks.com. Renee Grafe. Renee Grafe was born in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and grew up near Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She received her bachelor's degree in art from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. After graduation, she started her career illustrating publications for the University of Wisconsin Extension for four years and began freelancing with local and national agencies. Renee has illustrated more than 70 books for children. The most well-known are the Kirsten Books in the American Girl Collection and the My First Little House books by Laura Ingalls Wilder for HarperCollins. Renee lives in quaint Cedarburg with her family. All right, well, that's all I have for you friends today. And I hope that you can always charge your emotions to the game, to the craft, and to the art. And keep on practicing, keep on working, because you're bound to be whoever you're determined to be. Bye friends!